Hello and welcome to another video about the Labour Party investigations process. I am making no apologies for what may seem to some a slightly nuanced, niche, nerdy kind of thing to be looking at. What's happening through the Labour Party investigations process at the moment is that people on the left are systematically being blocked from standing for council positions, from standing for Member of Parliament. In addition to that, left voices are being kept out of the wider debate in the media. There's calls to cancel them regularly on grounds of anti-Semitism. And in addition to that, left ideas are being kept out of debate within the party and more widely in our society. And when we see this obscene rush to war that we're seeing at the moment, when we see the growing economic inequality, when you see, we see the dismal failure to deal with the impending climate crisis, it hurts all of us if left ideas and people on the left are kept out of state power, out of local and national governments, and are kept out of public debate. That, in the broadest sense, is what is happening in part through the investigations process and in part through the wider use of anti-Semitism to conduct a witch hunt of the left in this country. So the reason I'm making another video is because something happened yesterday. I got a response to a complaint that I put in and the juxtaposition between that dismissive response and the actions that are being taken against me and other people on the left made me really want to reflect on that and to publicise it. So what happened was I made a complaint to the Labour Party on the 4th of September 2019 about a member of Hackney Labour who abused me in public, who tweeted abusive things about me. Yesterday I was told in an email, which had no name attached to it, that my complaint has been assessed and we will be taking no further action at this time. This is because what you have complained about does not fall within what we can accept for investigation under our complaints policy. We apologise for the time it has taken for us to respond to the issue you raised. The time being about two and a half years. When I posted this response on Twitter, I found that quite a lot of other people had got similar replies to complaints they'd put in over the years. So it's clearly being used to get rid of a backlog of complaints made by members of the left in a hopeful moment when the left was in charge of the party against people on the right who have been abusing them, uh, harassing them, bullying them. So these are being dismissed. And the first thing I'm going to do in this video, in this first section, is to tell you what that complaint was because I think my complaint is probably typical of many many others that have been submitted and that maybe weren't even submitted but reflect experiences that people have had as activists on the left of the Labour Party. The second thing I'm going to do is to talk about the attacks that are being perpetrated against many of us through the investigations process and as a contrast to the dismissive approach to complaints from the left and the third thing I'm going to do is talk about why we got to this point, how we got to this point, and how it was under left leadership of the Labour Party that these structures that are being used to attack us were put into place. I'm not doing this to blame anyone. The situation when Jenny Formby and others took over at the Labour Party was really, really difficult. I don't think there's anything that I would have been able to do that would have solve these problems. I think Jenny did absolutely brilliant things in lots of ways, but inevitably we're left where we are and it's important to investigate that and to talk frankly about that. So um, if you don't want to watch the whole video, because I know my videos are ridiculously long, if you just want to jump to a particular section, in the description box below this video there are timestamps. So you just have to click on the time for the section that you want to jump to and it will take you straight there. Um, in addition, if you do find something of value in this video, please share it and please help YouTube to share it. YouTube has an algorithm and the way that things get noticed by that algorithm is for them to be commented on, for them to be liked, for them to be watched. So if you feel this should be shared, please give it a thumbs up please add a comment, it can be short or long. So this is the first part, my complaint. So this is my only serious use of the complaints process was this one complaint. I did have used it in a kind of um, half satirical way, half serious way to draw attention to the abuses of people in power within our party. 
So for example, I complained about David Evans, who's a general secretary. I complained about Amy Foday, who was regional director where I am. I complained about Tony Blair, Jess Phillips, Chuck Romana, Joan Ryan with Cadbury, Gareth Thomas, and Angela Smith. Um, as an example, I complained that Jess Phillips told Diane Abbott to fuck off, announced this on Twitter, and joined in laughing and mocking her on national television. I complained that Joan Ryan, who is no longer a Labour MP, thankfully, wrote a letter to her constituents during the 2017 general election, supporting public criticism of Corbyn and asking people to vote for her on the grounds that this would not lead to him becoming Prime Minister. She was arguing that people shouldn't want Jeremy Corbyn to be Prime Minister. She was basically saying that she didn't want that either. Pretty appalling behaviour, in my opinion, for any party member, but particularly for an MP. And similarly, I complained that Ruth Cadbury, who sadly still is a Labour MP, was filmed by the BBC saying the same thing on the phone to a voter. But I didn't expect anything to come of these complaints. Um, nothing did come of these complaints. But the one complaint that I put in formally, I did expect and hope something to come from it. Certainly more than a just, this is outside our remit. So I'm going to read the tweets that I was complaining about. These tweets come from a councillor in Hackney, um, Steve Rice. He was commenting on a tweet from the Community Security Trust who have as a remit to protect the Jewish community um, from anti-Semitism, to monitor it, to address security issues within our community. Um, and particularly about a report that they brought out called Engines of Hate, the online networks behind the Labour Party's anti-Semitism crisis. Steve Race wrote, shaming for me as a Labour member to see that my constituency Labour Party secretary, that's me, is named as one of the 36 engine room Twitter accounts that propagates a narrative that attempts to deny anti-Semitism in the party and seeks to silence or campaigns against people who raise it as an issue. I'm going to scroll down and read the rest. Tweet two in this thread. Labour members can't pick and choose which racisms or bigotries we want to speak about and campaign against. Anyone who spends any time on Twitter can easily find anti-Semitism from people purporting to be Labour or Corbyn supporting people. Tweet three, singling out anti-Semitism as the one racism people are willing to ignore is in itself anti-Semitic. So while it is shaming, it's also the duty of all decent Labour members to not stay silent. And for us to make clear, this isn't acceptable within the party. Four. Finally, while there remain good people in the party who will highlight and fight against this, it's up to all Labour members who agree to stick with it, call it out, vote it down, whatever it takes. Walking away while there's an ideological fight ongoing doesn't fix anything. So. Why I chose to go through the complaints process. Okay. Okay, so it's quite upsetting reading those tweets now, still, even though it's quite a long time ago. I wasn't actually on Twitter at that time, um, so I couldn't say anything about it. I um, suspended my account because I was working for the Labour Party. I felt like I didn't want to make myself a target at that time through Twitter. So I'd um, just taken myself offline. So I couldn't say anything. It was really hurtful to have other councillors supporting what Steve said. A couple other councillors did, as did someone who's going to be a councillor as from May, um, assuming that safe Labour seats, that safe Labour seats in Hackney stay as safe Labour seats. Um, it didn't get a lot of likes, but I did get some, and like I say, it got some from from people who are very important here um, and, and joined the attack on me. So I decided to use the formal complaints process even though I hadn't done that before in the face of abuse and I did that for three reasons. First of all because I tried informal methods, raising this with Steve, raising this through the local council labour whips um, and none of this worked. I mean, I've been asked by a Labour councillor to delete a tweet that I'd made 
which wasn't abusive in any way, but was uh, seen as a problem by some of the councillors that I tagged in it. And because I was local party secretary and I'm in the interest of unity, I deleted that tweet without any problems. I didn't understand why that same respect couldn't be shown to me that Steve could not be told he needed to delete that tweet in the interest of unity as I had been told. But that didn't happen, unfortunately. The second reason was because um, the left were running the complaints process at that time, the left were running the party. So I felt like it was possible that something like what I was reporting would get a fair hearing. I think that was naive given the systems in place and given the way things work, but that's what I hoped. And the third reason was because someone from the right of the party locally um, said to me that it was actually appalling what Steve had done and that I deserved better um, and made me feel like I was entitled to not be abused in, in public, which is something um, it's weird that I had to have the right give me permission to do that, but I think I did. So I'm going to read now the complaint that I put in. On 4th of August, Steve Race, a Hackney Labour councillor and a member of the same local party, constituency Labour Party, as me, tweeted a thread of four abusive tweets about me. He did not name me, but identified me as his constituency Labour Party secretary, and so I would be identifiable to all Hackney Labour members, many non-members in Hackney, and even to many hundreds, perhaps thousands of others outside of Hackney. My formal complaint is on two grounds, bringing the party into disrepute and online abuse. Point one, bringing the party into disrepute. This thread involves a local councillor attacking a prominent local party activist. I was possibly the most prominent local party activist outside of councillors at that time. And I was an elected officer of the local party. This presents Labour in a bad light locally and risks losing us both voters and members. It could even be used by opposition parties against Hackney Labour at the next local elections. It also accepts the findings of the Community Security Trust report that accounts which use hashtags like GTTO, which stands for Get the Tories Out, and JC9, which supports the left slate for the National Executive, are engines of hate. That was not, in my view, a narrative we should be supporting, and it was, as I point out in this complaint, irregardless of whether anything they tweet is anti-Semitic. As a professional researcher who has looked at this report in detail, it's clearly not attempting objectivity, but is instead attempting to link the Labour Party to anti-Semitism to support the narrative that the party is institutionally anti-Semitic. Supporting this position publicly by agreeing with the report's smearing of me gives credence to this viciously anti-Labour narrative. Point two, online abuse. The thread says that not only do I not take anti-Semitism seriously, but that I seek to silence or campaign against people who raise this. It continues by putting me into a group of people who pick and choose which racisms and bigotries we want to speak out about. While it does not say directly that I am not one of the decent Labour members or one of the good people in the party, the meaning is clear. Most upsetting is that he says that such behaviour is anti-Semitic. As someone who is Jewish, who has experienced anti-Semitism and organises against it locally, including as my constituency party's contact for labour against racism and fascism, this is both deeply hurtful and untrue. Many organisations and experts agree that anti-Semitism is being weaponised against the left. It's not anti-Semitic to say that, and it is abusive to direct such an accusation against an individual as Steve does against me. Given that Steve knows that I'm Jewish, his tweets reproduce the anti-Semitic discourse of dividing good Jews from bad Jews. I continued. Finally, I'd like to stress this has taken a personal toll on me and that as constituency Labour party secretary, remember this is a very intense voluntary role, I feel that this sort of behaviour fuels divisions within the local party which many of us have worked hard for years to address. Indeed, I did not report this formally immediately because I tried to use informal approaches to resolve because I tried to use informal approaches to resolve the situation. Please take this as a request that Steve Race's behaviour is formally investigated for violating the rule book requirement on members of Labour Group 
to act in a way that does not bring the party into disrepute, page 62, and for violating the Labour Party's code of conduct social media policy, to quote, abusing someone online is just as serious as doing so face to face. We stand against all forms of abuse and will take action against those who commit it. Okay. So I'm using this complaint. I don't think it's particularly special. I'm sure there's lots of people who've experienced much worse. I did subsequently experience not public abuse, but more kind of direct bullying that happened in meetings, which was pretty horrible as well. I know that most left wing activists in the party have experienced stuff like this. So I'm, I'm giving it and sharing it as a kind of fairly typical example, which the party do not see as something that is legitimately within the complaints process. Part two. So if this is not what the complaints process is doing, what is it doing? So on the same day that I got that email yesterday, I read David Rosenberg's account of why he's decided to leave the Labour Party. And it's called Tipping Point, and I'm going to talk about his tipping point. I think it's a really moving account. He makes a lot of criticisms of the way the Labour Party has gone under Keir Starmer's leadership and David Evans's leadership of the party as well. And those are all worth reading and I'll put a link to the full article in the description box below this video, along with all the other things that I talk about. So what he says is, the cynicism of their phony war on anti-Semitism provided the ultimate tipping point that's compelled me to leave what has become a toxic party. I am leaving in disgust as well as anger at having discovered how my own ideas and commentary as a Jewish socialist are being manipulated by disciplinary bodies in the party to help and exclude other left-wing members. So I'm going to come on to that. I first want to talk about Diana Neslin's case because David talks about that and that's been in the news. And Diana is a fantastically brave and determined and principled woman. I don't know her particularly well. I've been in meetings with her, but um, you know, full solidarity and credit for standing up for, for so many of us. David writes about her, she has suffered several rounds of accusations and investigations from the party's bureaucracy, in the midst of which she was diagnosed with cancer and also lost her husband. Just as she was taking the party to court to assert her right to express anti-Zionist beliefs in the party without being condemned as anti-Semitic, you would think that with a strong Jewish tradition of anti-Zionism, that it would make sense that Diana, who's Jewish, would have the right to speak about that in the party. But as that was happening, they finally backed down the party, presumably fearful of losing a case. But again, no apology was offered. Instead of cherishing members like Diana, the Labour Party is punishing them. So I'm going to talk more now about what David says about his tipping point. So he said, I was conscious that many Jewish Labour members I knew were being disciplined by the party for making comments on social media very similar to those that I had made. So that includes expressing non-Zionist positions, anti-Zionist positions, being critical of the treatment of Palestinians by the Israeli army, by settlers, by the courts, by Israel's government, and openly criticising the views of right-wing Jewish bodies in our community that define themselves as community leaders and claim to express the voice of the community. He says, I then discovered through informal sources that something worse was happening. This worst thing was that non-Jewish, left-wing Labour members were being accused of anti-Semitism if they liked, shared or retweeted certain social media posts that I had written. Um, these had been carefully assembled and were appearing in the charge sheets accompanying notices of investigation. Those are the notices which the Labour Party send out to people to say that there's a problem, that disciplinary processes are looking into you, that you need to watch out. Um, they're designed to instil fear that you're told to keep them silent, to not speak about them. If you do speak about them, you do as I have, often get a second complaint about talking about your investigation in public. So the sharing and liking of David Rosenberg's tweets and Facebook posts were also being presented to some candidates seeking to become councillors in their interviews in ways that implied their candidacy would be viewed negatively if they had indeed liked, shared or retweeted such posts. So there we see that 
what is happening through the investigations process, through these disciplinary systems, is that if you are liking or sharing tweets from a lovely socialist Jewish historian and critical thinker like David, that's being used to stop you from being a council candidate for Labour. And that's what made him leave. That is what's happening through the disciplinary systems. This is what they're doing. They're not dealing with the kind of abuse that I was facing and that thousands, perhaps many, many tens of thousands of people were confronting inside the party itself. They're dealing with someone who shared a post by David Rosenberg. And I'm sure it's happened with my posts as well. So if you've had action taken against you because you shared some of my posts, then get in touch. I'd be interested to know, I'll keep it in confidence. So I'm just gonna take you through what happened to me I think people know this, I'll do it briefly. On the 6th of September 2021, I received a notice of investigation. I had seven days to reply. Um, I eventually got an extension after the third time of asking. I submitted a response on the 6th of October. I made that response public. It's a written response. Um, on the 13th of October, a week later, I got a second notice of investigation. Most of the charges were identical those on the first, but I still had to reply. Again, I had seven days to reply. I asked for an extension again, and I got this. On the 27th of October, I submitted a response in the form of video, which I also posted to YouTube, where it's had, thank you to anyone who's watched it and shared it, it's had about 7,400 views so far. So this is what the process is doing. I want to include in the description a link to the responses that I made. I want to read a section of the written response I made to my first notice of investigation. I'm still waiting to hear from the party. Maybe I'll wait years. Who knows? It's, it's months and months since my first response. Um, so what I wrote was, the systematic ongoing attack on the Labour left, within which the party's disciplinary processes are being used to destroy a left political insurgency, is also a means to extend the bullying and abuse to which left-wing members have grown accustomed. While I was local party secretary, members sent me abusive emails, trolled me on Twitter, shouted at me repeatedly and aggressively in meetings, and made a multitude of unevidenced public accusations against me. I know through the local party secretary's forum on Facebook that such experiences are the norm. Many, many people have much worse than me. Many with impacts on their physical and mental health that were extreme. And people kept on fighting, kept on working, sometimes three to four days a week voluntarily as local party secretaries, despite that abuse. Um, so just massive credit to all those wonderful local party secretaries that I, that I worked with while I was one. So I continued. In December 2020, another Hackney Labour Party member made defamatory statements about me in a meeting attended by a around 100 people, forcing me to instruct a solicitor in order to secure a traction and an apology. There was no point in using the processes within the party I'd worked out by that point. I had to take legal action. It was fairly effective and quick in that case because it was such a clear-cut case. It's much harder when it's a case of abuse through Labour Party processes because legal systems are very reluctant to intervene in, in political parties. So thank you to everyone who's offered to help crowdfund legal action, but I just don't think it will be effective. I've had legal advice on that. I want to continue with the final paragraph of what I wrote. On one occasion, after my attempts to resolve an instance of abuse informally was shut down, so this is the case I mentioned earlier um, of Steve Race's tweets, I tried to use the party's disciplinary system to address it by submitting a formal complaint for online abuse and for bringing the party into disrepute. It's now over two years since I submitted this complaint and it has yet to be assigned to an investigator. Instead, the party's extensive disciplinary apparatus is being turned on me, most likely given the timing and content of the notice of investigation at the instigation of local Hackney Labour Party members who abused me in the past. This makes you and the system complicit in that behaviour and complicit in the suppression of dissenting voices in the party and complicit in the silencing of Jewish socialists in speaking of truth. This in its darkness and brutality is the weaponization of anti-Semitism. Um, I've been really encouraged by the response that I've had to the videos that I've made. 
um, to the publicizing of the situation that I'm in, not because it's unique, but because I think it's an instructive case and because I'm more open, I guess, to doing this than other people who are in maybe a more difficult situation um, who have similar investigations being conducted against them. And um, I'd like to share something that Claudia Berlin said in a response video to a video that um, I made with um, Daniel Taylor, so I'll put a link into to him and his channel in the description. Um, and she comments on my case, and I think it's really pertinent what she says. You should definitely watch her video, I'll put a link to that one as well. And I think the way she expresses it is really, really powerful. She says, it's just the most awful thing I can think of, to be smeared as an anti-Semite and then to be ignored by the party that you've worked with and for and treated in such a way. To be dismissed by things that matter to you, by things that have affected your life. It's absolutely gutting and it's not right. In your heart, if this wasn't something that was being used factionally, if this was a mistake of the process, then why has it not been fixed? Why has there been no apology? Why has there been no, we're so sorry, this has happened. How can we fix this? How can we make it better? Why has there been no communication? If this, if this was a system meant to protect Jewish people, they would be protecting Jewish people. It wouldn't matter if they agreed with the Jewish people or not, what opinion they had, they should be protected right. And that's not happening. And there's no move made to rectify it. And so it's obviously intentional. Yes, this is obviously intentional, absolutely. We need to recognize it as intentional and we need to tackle it in that way. Part three, I want to look at the way we got here. Um, and like I said, it's, we got here under left leadership. This is not to criticize that left leadership. It's to say that this is what happens when there's an all out assault on the party and when the movement is divided. And, um, but it is what it is. And certainly there were cases we know under Jeremy Corbyn, under the previous general secretary, or the first general secretary that he was working with, Ian McNichol, who hated Jeremy Corbyn and worked against him. Um, I'm not gonna mention all these cases, there are so many. There are high profile cases, which people will know, but I want to just shout out to my um, friend and comrade, Peter Gates, who was appallingly treated by the party um, under both Ian Nicol and then I think under Jenny Formby, a case that went on for years. Um, I think I want to mention him partly because I know him, um, but also partly because uh, it's important to remember that the high profile cases are just the tip of the iceberg and that there are so many other cases of members up and down the country who, who were affected. Um, so we know about the sabotage that happened under Ian McNichol's leadership of the party. We did see that in the leaked report. Um, but I think we need to also look at what happened under Jenny Formby's leadership and that's also covered by the leaked report. It's not sections of the leaked report that we talk about very often. So I'm going to talk about them now. So it was clearly very difficult when Jenny Formby took over. Um, in fact, the entire staff who were dealing with complaints resigned or went long-term sick or both very shortly after she took over. And as a result, it was very difficult to fill those positions. I guess it's not a particularly pleasant job to work in investigations in the Labour Party. So it was some time before these posts were filled and often they had to be re-advertised. So what happened under, under the new team, the left team? What they did was focus very much on anti-Semitism, completely understandable given the attacks it was being used to make on, on Jeremy Corbyn's leadership and on all of us. So what they did was they put in place a matrix um, a decision-making matrix of how to handle cases of anti-Semitism. It was very complicated and was attempting to systematise that process. And one of the things they also introduced was that previously, if you had shared something on Twitter or on Facebook, that wouldn't be taken as evidence against you, outside of a very small period of time, summer 2016, when they were trying to stop people voting for Jeremy Corbyn. The rest of the time, that was not seen as legitimate evidence. Now, under the left leadership that was seen as legitimate evidence. Now clearly that was in response to the fact that people were showing how sometimes people were sharing really problematic content um, and as a result that was being used to attack the party. But nevertheless that was a reinforcement of these processes, a, 
that was an enlargement of the work of the investigations team. In addition to that, there was a move away from what had happened before, which was focusing on notices of investigation, where you can carry on being a full member of the party, to notice of investigation accompanied by a suspension when you were no longer able to be a member of the party, to go to meetings, to campaign, to take part in internal elections, any of that kind of stuff, to help run the party. So we can see that um, shift, but we can also see a huge upsurge in the number of cases being investigated. So in 2016, there were no expulsions for anti-Semitism. In 2017, there was one. In the first year where Jenny took office, so she took office partway through 2018, that went up a little bit to 10. In her first full year in post, her only full year in post, 2019, there were 45. So it's still not that many, but obviously that's a huge increase on one in 2017 and zero in 2016. As I said, the balance between notice of investigation and suspensions changed. So let's have a look at how in 2017 there were 10 suspensions and 22 notices of investigation for anti-Semitism. By 2019, which as I said was Jenny's only full year in, in post, that was 296 suspensions and 283 notices of investigation without suspension. This was the first time there were more suspensions than non-suspension cases. And suddenly we've got about 600 people involved as compared to just two years ago when there were 32 people involved. 600 people means at this stage it's pretty much touching everyone because those were not just random people, those were generally the most engaged activists because of the way this was used to target people. So often you were taking out people who were key to local campaigning and local organisation and so it's having an effect on the morale of a lot of local parties and other activists. Cases were also sped up. So by August 2019 it was taking two weeks for new complaints to be logged and acted on. Think about how my complaint and other complaints languished for years without any action. Even under the left leadership, there were months when my complaint wasn't actioned. It was never actioned under that leadership. And yet anti-Semitism complaints were dealt with within two weeks. Now, these are overwhelmingly complaints which are not from party members, which are not to do with things which happened within the Labour Party. Whereas the other complaints were things which were really affecting local parties, how they, how they function, how activists feel, our mental and physical health, how much parties are able to keep going. They undermine your ability to do your job, not just because of the psychological impact on you, but also because if people are attacking you and trying to turn people against you um, and play people off against each other, then it affects the capacity you have to organise the local party. So it's hugely damaging. But these things were being left in favour of someone who's not a party member who saw a couple of tweets they didn't like. They have every right to object to those tweets, but the prioritising of those within two weeks was driven by the media agenda rather than by what made sense to help the party function. In addition to that, the Governance and Legal Unit is not simply taking complaints from people about anti-Semitism. As I said, it's most of the complaints were coming from non-members and half of the complaints came from one individual who actually regularly abused staff. They got rapid responses, whereas activists like me were getting no response at all. Um, it was totally driven by a very abusive agenda and I feel really sorry for the people in complaints who had to deal with this and, and whose agenda was to try and contain this like brutal attacks on them and brutal attacks on the party. But the way they did it was deeply damaging. So what they then started doing was instead of simply taking a complaint in and processing it, they would do extensive social media searches on anyone who's complained about. Again, given the media agenda, this makes sense because what would happen previously is that a complaint would come in, they'd look at what the complaint was about, they'd deal with that, and then someone would dig up some other dirt on that person and they say, oh, but how come you haven't suspended them? How come you haven't excluded them? Um, so they would have to do really extensive social media searches to check there was no other dirt they were missing. So, or not even dirt actually, just stuff that could be interpreted as dirt, that could be taken by the media as dirt, which, you know, wasn't really dirt as we've come to understand it. Um, and not only that, but they were encouraged 
to search out people and put their own complaints in. So not to wait until a complaint was made about someone, but to search through reports like the one I mentioned earlier, the Community Security Trust report, Engines of Hate, to find the people in there, to check on their content, decide whether we needed to take disciplinary action as a party against them, to search out proactively Facebook groups, not Facebook groups even run by Labour Party members, but even Facebook groups that mentioned Corbyn somewhere along the way in the title or the description and the Labour Party would go to Facebook and try and get these groups shut down and again totally understandable why they did this but really problematic. The leaked report which as we know was written by the left is clear that anti-semitism is a structural problem in the party. To quote from that report this report thoroughly disproves any suggestion that anti-semitism is not a problem in the party or that it is all a smear, in scare quotes, or a witch hunt, in scare quotes. The report's findings prove the scale of the problem and could help end denialism amongst parts of the party membership, which has further hurt Jewish members and the Jewish community. So what is denialism? This is really important, I think, to understand for what's happening now. This is a term staff use to refer to a range of statements about the scale and severity of anti-Semitism in Labour that view disciplinary actions taken in anti-Semitism cases as part of a purge or a witch hunt. I would say it's not denialism, it's truth-telling. Denialism is actually the report's position, which is to deny that denialism is the truth. That's a little bit contorted, but there you go. This is what happens, we get into ridiculous contortions. So the report is pretty understanding about denialism. It says it's incorrect, but we can see it as a response to the relentless demonization of Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party in recent years. We can see this as, to quote them, this has encouraged a defensive attitude among Labour members and supporters who accurately view such allegations as smears by political and media opponents. For some members, anti-Semitism is just part of that story, something political opponents use to attack Labour. Yeah, it is. That's not all it is, but it really is. So how was denialism dealt with? It was a bit of a problem because they knew it's not anti-Semitism, denialism. So in December 20, 2019, the Governance and Legal Unit, the people responsible for this, the complaints team, discussed the issue of denialism and in particular problem of dealing with members who advocate denialist narratives that do not necessarily have anti-Semitic elements, but who persistently insist on these narratives in a manner that undermines the party's opposition to anti-Semitism and alienates Jewish members. Of course, I would dispute that. Um, it depends which Jewish members you're talking about, of course. But not only that, but I don't think it undermines the party's opposition to anti-Semitism to tell the truth about what is being done in the name of anti-Semitism. On 21st of January 2020, this same team of people who were responsible for investigations and Labour Party at the time, agreed the formulation they were going to use was jeopardising the party's fight against anti-Semitism. So they weren't going to call it anti-Semitic because they knew it wasn't, so they had to come up with a form of words that would work. They also talked about making Labour spaces unwelcoming and exclusionary to many Jewish people. And that would allow them, they felt, again to quote them, to clearly distinguish between people who've just shared an article or two downplaying the issue and the people who spend their waking night and day aggressively campaigning on this, like me, I guess, and I think I've been forced into that by this ridiculous process that I'm being put through, that was put in place by the people who would judge me for spending their waking night and day aggressively campaigning, perhaps, I don't know. A few days later, on 24th of January 2020, senior staff discussed the issue of individuals not crossing lines, so we're not crossing lines, but we have persistent problematic behaviour. As the formulation there was bringing the party into disrepute, I'm going to put something onto the matrix, that kind of flow chart that tells you what to do if it's a complaint of anti-Semitism, to systematise that, to, to ensure it's dealt with in a consistent and clear way. Although it did say that this is a sensitive, contentious issue. It is indeed a sensitive, contentious issue. It's become more sensitive and more contentious since that left team was replaced by a right wing team. Um, they have now got the disciplinary apparatus they need 
to investigate, suspend and expel us. And similarly, a disciplinary apparatus that prevents many from expressing solidarity with those impacted because they're scared about what will be done to them if they do express solidarity. It is a blank check to the right to enact a factional war against us and what we stand for. It's being done to me, it's being done to hundreds, if not thousands of other people. It's very hard to know the scale of this because a lot of times it's simply um, warnings on conduct. It's simply people who know that there's no point in them applying to be a council candidate because they get blocked. It's done with a nod and a wink. It's done in really complex ways. It, it works to shut people up and shut people out. And of course, it's being done to Jeremy Corbyn, who is, I guess, a denialist in these terms um, for his persistence in telling the truth. And um, it is criminal that he is not a Labour MP. And, and I don't know, I have no answers for this, but I wanted to say it. So if you got to this point, thank you for watching. Um, please tell me what you think of the situation, if you have any ideas for how we can go about tackling it. Um, otherwise, yeah, goodbye.